Welcome to another Keel Hauled Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Logan, and we've got a lot of Sea of Thieves news to cover today, so tie yourselves to the mast and hold fast. Ahoy there, pirates. I hope you had yourselves a good week and a good weekend. I know I did. This week, I'm going to be covering a few things, including the patch notes, my feelings on the second week of Curse Sales, commendations, and a little bit of the San Diego Comic-Con panel. Everything's kind of mashed up into one thing, so format's a little strange this week, so just roll with it. We are now in the second week of Curse Sales, and with that, we've got patch 1.2.1 which is now live. Some of the changes that came with this patch, the Curse Sails Battle Encounter now has a better indicator. The battle music can now be heard from greater distances. Additionally, the flow when UI banners appear and music begins has been improved. As well as Curse Sails resources, the treasure items and the barrels of plenty will now float longer. This will allow for greater opportunity to find the resources and treasures mid-fight. The Curse Sails Battle Cooldown, the timer between battles, has been extended to give players a chance to collect loot dropped by defeating the Skeleton Crews. Curse Sails Battle Despawn, the despawn timer has been increased, which will give Sunk Crews a greater chance to sail back and continue the battle they started. Skeleton Ship VFX, improvements have been made to the visual effects of water splashes when skeleton ships emerge. The bug fixes are actually some of the better bug fixes I've seen. The skeleton forts have now been re-enabled. If you haven't noticed the giant skeleton cloud now floating about in the sky while you're doing your skeleton battles, skeletons and animals now spawn as intended. Didn't know they were unintentionally spawning. Uh, players fired from cannons will no longer occasionally travel in unintended directions. This is something I've actually noticed. I'm very happy for that the accuracy of a cannon is a lot better, although I still run into problems once in a while. Firing yourself out of a cannon no longer causes the muffled cannon audio or the, the tinnitus, uh, as I was noticing. Ship liveries that change the color of the ship's hull now correctly change the color of the capstan. And remember, capstan is the thing that you push to raise the anchor. Those are going to be something that's going to be customizable along with the cannons eventually in the game. Uh, alliances join, leave, disband pop-ups now appear even when a player is in the flag box menu. The brigantine's missing bell has now been found and added. Uh, the players speaking to a gold hoarder NPC at an outpost will no longer incorrectly receive the Hungering Deep Begins banners. Really weird that that even happened. I never even saw it. We're still waiting on the Kraken that is still temporarily disabled due to performance issues, and they are working to enable this feature as quickly as possible. I definitely hope that this is coming sooner rather than later, although I understand that they are working hard to make sure that there aren't issues with the Kraken when it does come back into play. We've already seen some issues with skeleton ships spawning with no crews, which is uh, causing a lot of people to lock up that server, gather all the, the ships, and start farming out uh, all of that, that, that loot that they're getting because it's a lot easier to take care of them. So if you do find yourselves in a situation where you are put into a, a crew that doesn't have an actual skeleton crew i think it's been fixed by now but if it does happen just do yourself a favor don't really engage with it if you've already gathered the resources uh go ahead kill it get your loot and then try and find a server that isn't bugged out so you don't have unintended consequences that's going to do it for the patch notes this is the second week of the three week campaign for curse sales to be honest this is probably the least amount of time i've played sea of thieves since launch not including the 11 days of hell at the start of July. Why would I not be playing that much, you ask? Well, a lot of it has to do with this campaign and being a pirate legend. If you're not pirate legend, this is hands down the best way to get golden reputation. Since I no longer see reputation gains, though, I personally can't speak to how much you'll get per item, and that will also vary based on what level you're at. That being said, I have probably only done the battles two times each. The deterrence on my part comes back to last week's episode where I talk about the amount of prep time involved with doing a skeleton battle. Currently, if you want to do a skelly battle, you should head to the nearest fort and start taking stock from them. Your best option is to try 
and get a shipwreck on the way to battle for supplies. I've heard more and more that people are starting, still having trouble, finding other crews to participate in skeleton battles. Also, some folks are jumping into open crews to try and get into a group that's already prepped. The one thing I've heard overall is that people enjoy the fights, but the time restriction is the wrong way to approach the release. I tend to agree with this sentiment. I feel like each five wave ship battle should have a longer cooldown, even longer than the current patch increased it by. Even with multiple ships, there is still a good chance you will be low on supplies at the end of the battle, or you lose your ship and come back with a minimum amount of supplies. Aside from long spawn timers for the ships, I was hoping that, much like the Hungering Deep, you could summon the skeleton ships whenever you wanted, and they wouldn't be restricted by specific areas during different parts of the day. Although, based on the information given to us from developer updates, it sounds like there's a lot of work that had to be done to get that many ships in one area. Also, having the skeleton ships spawn in one zone during a certain amount of time would focus where players would want to go up to Alliance for a battle. The skeleton ships would be better off randomly spawning with a different curse instead of a set curse per area. This would always put you on guard. You'd, you'd never be sure which curse you'd have to deal with, and your crew would need to adapt to the situation on the fly. Dealing with five waves of skeleton ships is tough. It's definitely a challenge, and while the Alliance system helps players who prefer smaller crew sizes, it's not always going to be a possibility for everyone. This takes me to commendations. I was asked to break down my feelings on them, as well as a majority of what they are. Uh, for the most part, I like what they've done with commendations. As long as you participate during the three weeks, these should all be achievable. You'll need to complete a battle in each ship type, and there are commendations for sinking a certain number of ships, and I think these are the best designed commendations for this event. I think the the other ones that are timed or have specific requirements, like forming an alliance with the appropriate sails, are less player-friendly. I think offering 300 doubloons is a great way to incentivize players to try out multiple ships as well as completing the battles multiple times, though I think we need to be more creative with our commendations and less restrictive. So I was talking to Bodhi Slam last night about this, and he brought up a solid point that the commendations should inform players of new ways to play instead of making them time or item restricted. An example he gave was a commendation that rewarded players by helping or for sinking ships by throwing a bucket of water on them. And I have to agree with him on this. That being the case, I'm sure by the third week it will be much easier to find players who have gone through the Wanda quest line and picked up their sales. Having a commendation that requires each of those sales helps ensure players are completing the quest line, but there are already three commendations as incentive to getting those sales. Having commendations, as Bodhi suggested, that have you sink a ship by throwing a bucket of water onto the skeleton ship will help give players a new way to approach dealing with ships when you're low on supplies. And this happened to us the other night when we ran out of cannonballs and powder kegs. We ended up having to ram the ships, leaving at least one hole in our ship to have a constant supply of water. As a brigantine, we had one person man the ship, another jump aboard the skeleton ship to defend breaches in the hull and gather supplies, while the third person worked on throwing buckets of water onto the ship and taking care of additional holes in the ship. It worked out, but it was an arduous experience to say the least. Thankfully, the curse we were dealing with was the anchor curse, so we had a full control of ourselves during the battle. It was just a matter of resources management. I would recommend doing away with commendations that are time specific as it still punishes players who don't have a lot of time to play. Coupled with the amount of time of prep for each battle, there's a lot riding on completing a skeleton battle on the first try. Not to mention potentially dealing with betrayals afterwards if they're in alliance. I still want to impress on Rare that respecting a player's time during each play session is paramount. As things get introduced and no vertical progression to compensate at higher reputation levels, supplies are the only variable in dealing with situations in the world. 
As an example, this came into play with my latest adventure on the seas. This week, I jumped into a brigantine with the bloodthirsty pirate Thorwath and gets me a beer, who I will just call Captain B from now on. We went out from Galleon's Grave Outpost to see about getting prepped for a skeleton battle in the wilds. We had gathered as much supplies as the outpost would offer before heading out and noticing that there was already a brig out by Marauder's Arch battling two skeleton ships. We sailed out to meet them and were happy to see that they already had their offer alliance flag up. As we joined up with them to do battle, we noticed that they had the ancient isles sails instead of the wilds. We asked if they could leave the battle while we took over, sail back to Galleon's Grave, and put on the appropriate sails for the area so that we could get credit for the last non-time-restricted commendation. Things went great after that. We battled each ship and managed to take down the skeleton captains without losing our ship. We gathered up the majority of the loot while dealing with very few supplies, a Meg trying to attack us, and a dozen sharks who were now swarming the seas like it was the end of May and didn't get the memo that Hungering Deep was over. As we were pushed by Meg, attempting to chomp us back to Galleon's grave, we pulled into port and turned in what loot we had scavenged from the battle. I will say that I think the Meg needs some updating. I don't know if she is balanced right now to account for the faster than sloop speed, since this is actually the second time I've been pushed around by her in a brig as if she was the little tugboat that could. All of this to get to my point about supplies being the difference between winning and losing. Shortly after turning in the last of our plunder and seemingly sated Thorwath logged off and Captain B and myself recruited Bodyslam to join the crew as we sailed south to Crow's Nest to take down what appeared to be an uncontested fort. It wasn't until we got down to Crow's Nest that we realized there was actually a galleon there working on the fort. It had been active for a while, and I imagine they must have only gotten there shortly before ourselves. We sailed by the anchored galleon and proceeded to lay into her with a full barrage of cannon fire. Captain B did an amazing job boarding the ship as the crew had just returned to the vessel after being caught unprepared for the engagement. A final shot with my eye of reach to the head of the last crew member at the end of the bowsprit put the nail in the coffin for the galleon as she sank to the depths shortly after. We resupplied as we were still running low after the skeleton battle, and it was short Shortly after a couple rounds of supplies that we noticed a big problem coming straight for us. The same galleon we had just sunk was full tilt and salty just two islands away. Unsure how they managed to get back so quickly, we skipped working on the fort and prepared for the next battle. This time, we were not so lucky. A couple bad choices were made and we were sinking, but we didn't go down without a fight. In fact, we didn't go down alone. While they had managed to distract us enough from our ship to sink, it was mainly due to the fact that we had dealt a second death blow to the galleon crew. When we walked through the ferryman's door and came back to the land of the living, it was immediately apparent how the galleon was able to get back so quickly. While we had just lost our ship at Crow's Nest Fort, we had spawned at Plunder Outpost. That's right, folks. Forts have been put back into the game, but the spawn distance has not been applied. The original spawn distances were now in effect and proved to be a tough pill to swallow. We didn't spend any time grabbing supplies. We sailed back to Crow's Nest Outpost to find out not only had the galleon beat us back, but a sloop had now joined the fray. With an island's distance away, I saw that the lone sloop, as valiant as it may have tried, had just tipped into the water, signaling its defeat. We pulled up to the galleon and began dropping shots into her hull and saved ourselves from being kegged by an enemy crew member. We were the better pirates, but with the spawn distances being so close, any victory was going to be short-lived. We had to beat them so badly that they didn't dare come back for the fort. We battled, and for the second time, we were sunk, but not before sinking their galleon. Our respawn destination, you wonder? Plunder Valley. Not much further than our original spawn. This time, on the way back to Crow's Nest, we took a few extra minutes to gather supplies at a shipwreck that was on our path back to the fort. This proved to be the best choice as we managed to get back to the fort and with the additional supplies outlasted the galleon and the returning sloop. Yes, we were the more skilled pirates, but due to the number of opponents and shorter stock of supplies, it was tough to keep afloat. After the fourth sinking of the galleon, they finally decided that they would seek other means of income, less costly and time-consuming leaving us a fort that was bugged. With a powder keg meeting in the middle of the fort, we all congratulated ourselves on beating out the other crews by resetting the fort wave in one solemn boom. 
Shortly after two simple waves of skeletons, we opened the vault and hauled our ill-gotten gains to Ancient Spire Outpost to resupply and head to the shores of plenty for the skeleton battle we had promised Bodhislam we'd do. A weird twist to the time spent at Ancient Spire was while we were refitting and taking a small breather, a fresh brigantine spawned on top of our ship, causing a collision. While Captain B went up to the tavern to investigate, Bodhi and myself gathered all the supplies off the fresh ship before it eventually sank as there was no one to repair it. A pirate legend had appeared in the tavern that was now occupied by Captain B. A few seconds later was a call out saying that he was now manning the Ferry of the Damned. This was the first time I'd ever had a ship spawn at an outpost that was already occupied made for some interesting discussions on the voyage to Smuggler's Bay, and I'm curious if any of you have had that kind of an issue before as well. Feel free to let me know. When all is said and done, the only thing I can take away from this is that supplies make the difference even to the most skilled pirates of the seas. Not that I consider myself to be most skilled, but I've sailed with Captain B and Thorwath a few times now, and every encounter is an eventual win. So if you do go out, make sure that you take your time to gather supplies because it can be the difference, especially with cursed sails becoming a permanent AI threat in the world. More than ever is it going to matter that you take some time to gather supplies as you never know what kind of ship you'll come across, whether it be AI or player based, and if they'll have cursed cannonballs and what those cursed cannonballs will do. <music> Looking ahead to this third and final week for curse sales, I hope everyone gets a chance to experience all the different curses. Here's what you can expect going into this week. The sleeping curse will be active for the shores of plenty. The poison curse will be active in the ancient isles and the raising and lowering of sails will be active for the wilds. How do I know this for sure? Well, I stared really closely at the commendations screen for a long time last night. Each commendation for the different crews has been in order of shores of plenty, ancient isles, and the wilds. Each commendation also has a small circle with a symbol indicating what curse is going to be active on it. This is where staring at a 4K monitor came into play. I was able to make out what the symbols for each crew was. The first being the moon and stars shrouded by the clouds for the Sandman crew. This will force your pirate to do the sleep emote. I'm going to assume that it will be similar to how the dancing curse worked and you'll you will be unable to control your character for a certain amount of time, most likely 10 seconds, unless an additional cursed cannonball hits the ship. The Ancient Isles had the symbol of a snake and will have the venomous cursed cannonballs, which will obstruct your vision the same way a snake spitting at you will. Make sure you have bananas on hand for this, as you'll probably have to deal with blindness and loss of health during this fight. Anyone not poisoned should be on the cannons or boarding the ship to defend breaches and gathering supplies. Supplies. The wilds will probably be the easiest to deal with this week and presumably the most accessible to evening players in the United States on the East Coast. The Siren's Gale will raise and lower the sails during the battle. This was the symbol of the mast with raised sails that was seen uh, first on Wanda's workshop's shelf a week prior to the cursed sails when I made a little diagram of which uh, cursed cannonballs were what and what they affected and the categories that they were in. Since most of the fights I've experienced have our ship sails mostly up, it won't be that tough if they raise our sails. And with the anchor curse, multiple shops, shots will lower and raise the anchor, canceling out the effect of the previous cannonball. So if you do get hit with the sail cursed cannonball, there's a good chance that if they hit you again, it may revert the sails to the, to the point that they were, so you won't lose speed or you won't move that far. That being said, try to make sure someone is always ready near the helm to turn the ship if the sails are lowered and you're headed for the rocks that seem to be the place marker for the engagement area. Hopefully, with this week's patch, we'll see the return of Karen the Kraken and a fix to the spawn distances for forts. While having forts as an alternative to skeleton battles is nice, I'm very curious to find out if Karen cares for cuddling with brigantines. Moving on, I want to let you all know the San Diego Comic-Con panel was released on Thursday. I'm not going to deep dive into this like I did with the streams they did during that week or the one they did from last week. 
The panel was fun to watch, but regarding news or information, we didn't get much out of it. The main focus of the panel was to talk a little bit more about Athena's fortune and how the first pirate legend came to be. I'm looking forward to this book from a lore perspective, as I'm curious to know how there are ghosts outside of the ferryman's boat, and why these ghosts are regulated to just the pirate legend tavern where the wreck of the Athena's fortune rests. Are their souls tied to the shipwreck? Will they ever be released? And why are we able to interact with them to buy clothing and liveries and grog? How did they die? Where is the fortune the pirate lord amassed during his time amongst the living? Who is the community member that is being immortalized in the book, and will they know who they are when it's released? How did the pirate legend get his way through the devil's shroud, and will it explain how the shroud works, and explain it being able to reveal and enshroud parts of the world? Can it go into more detail about merfolk and how they first became afflicted with a curse. There's so much we don't know, and I'm hoping that this book will give us a better idea of what happened before we got to the Sea of Thieves. Mike does go into why we only have outposts and not full ports in the Sea of Thieves. The simple explanation is that we are at the beginnings of the golden age of piracy, something he's he's said multiple times and is really starting to sink in. With time, we may eventually see fully fleshed out and populated ports, something I know a lot of pirates are looking forward to. In fact, Captain J from the Crow's Nest uh, on YouTube put out an interesting video making the argument that we need ports like Tortuga and Nassau as an in-game social meeting place for to form crews and alliances. I agree with this sentiment, and I wonder if that will ever be something that's implemented. As it stands, I imagined that the Pirate Legend Tavern was intended to be this kind of thing. You can go down and meet other pirate legends in the tavern, though I've only seen one other crew down there, and it was an intentional test to see if it did work. With more and more pirates playing, and many of them able to jump levels using the bilge rats as a catalyst to reaching pirate legend, I wonder if these taverns will become more populated. If that's the case, I want to recommend Rare make the pirate legend tavern the place where pirate legend crews spawn instead of the traditional taverns. There are still supplies down there as well as some vendors for gear, but having crews spawn in Athena's fortune will give more pirate legends a reason to form alliances for Athena's voyages, making it easier to complete voyages quicker. This would also give players a reason to go down there more frequently than grabbing the random voyage or picking up a newly earned ghostly gear. Uh, outside of the Fairy of the Damned, it's the only place I think is a server-wide instance, meaning it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, you'll be able to go to any outpost to access the Pirate Legend Tavern if you want to see if anyone's there. Then, after leaving the tavern, you'll be placed in an outpost that is available for a ship to spawn in. It's similar to what they had in mind for captaincy, but would be used now as a social gathering place just for legends. The main hiccup I see with this idea is how to overcome player griefing, as players spawning in will have different load times and it's still very easy to kill someone quickly with a blunderbuss. You can use a weapon locker to switch skins, effectively reloading your weapon. So the only thing that would prevent this is the pistol from the comics that prevented guns from being fired to be found and placed in the Pirate Legend Tavern. After that, it's up to the Legend crews to decide how they want to pirate. Keep to the code, though, and settle the matter on the seas, not in the taverns. I'd love to see more people populated in the world, especially if it's the means of setting up alliances for events. As it stands, there's a heavy reliance on outside communities and Xbox LFT G groups to gather players that are committed to working on a common cause. It helps keep players immersed in the game once they log in, but not everyone is comfortable in social environments governed by other players. I hope all of this is a non-issue and that most players have no trouble getting into a good crew, but I can't help but base this on the voices from different communities online. With all that being said, I'm still really happy with how the curse sales ended up. The skeleton battles are great. The cosmetics have been exemplary. The common have been rough but rewarding and as we move into the third week I'm looking forward to dealing with these last few crews to round out the commendations for the curse sales and eventually move into the next bilge rat adventures which has a lot of people concerned because Sonic Bob actually mentioned on reddit recently that the reapers mark will play an interesting role in the next bilge rat adventure regarding sea of friends uh, a lot of people seem to be considering curse sales as a way to have alliances and not really have any repercussions of 
betraying anyone because you all get loot. Uh, while I have betrayed uh, multiple times and haven't really been, trade, been betrayed that often, I find that alliances are beneficial, but with this Bilge Rat adventure coming in, what could the Reaper's Mark mean? <laughs> So last week, I didn't get to an email. Uh, the show was running long, and I didn't want to really kind of make people get turned off by just how long that episode was. So this week, I want to make up for that, and I want to read the email that I got from El Bardo. And I'm going to try and read it verbatim. It's a really good story, and I want to make sure you guys get all of it. So here goes. The evening of the third. Everything was lining up to be a great night of plundering the seas. I set out on my first voyage on the Brigantine, which is a fantastic ship in so many ways. Running op an open crew to meet some new like-minded pirates, we set out to find some buried treasure. After hitting a few of the local islands, we sailed into Golden Sands Outpost to sell off some recently acquired goodies. Upon arrival, we happened across a galleon looking to form an alliance and defend the shores of plenty from the onslaught of cursed ships. Come to find out, we have joined one of the largest armadas I have seen, which comprises five ships, one galleon, two brigs, and two sloops. We all decide for some strange reason to sail into battle on the galleon, leaving the other vessels just off the coast of Smuggler's Bay for an easy return should someone fall to the invading forces. During the battle, we take it to them, slaughtering ship after ship. Unfortunately, we end up losing the galleon during the fight, but one of the brigs arrives to keep the fight going with fresh supplies, and we take down the final ship and collect the loot. Upon returning to the outpost, we turn in the goods and have a merry time at the local pub celebrating the victory and the largest force I've seen ever assembled on the seas. This alone was a great battle and plenty of riches were had, but this was merely the beginning of the story. After parting ways, our brigantine sets sail to begin the lore quest to learn what is driving these skeletons to attack. This went well and was mainly uneventful, yet quite useful as we fully stocked our ship. This comes into play later in the story. During this voyage, we visit two abandoned forts, leading to amassing a large amount of gunpowder kegs in our crow's nest, 15 plus. After returning to Golden Sands and completing the lure quest, we decide it's time to defend the ancient isles. Heading towards the area we have been summoned to by the banners, we've noticed another brigantine engaged in combat with the dreaded skeletons. Upon arriving at the battle scene and joining their alliance, we engage the skeleton crew and bring their galleon to its final resting place among the sea floor. Little did we know, this last vessel was the evil captain and tons of loot floating up to our ship. We gladly began to take some of the loot while leaving the majority for the other crew as they battled much harder and much longer than us. After loading all the booty, we both set sail for Plunder Outpost to collect our riches. As the first crew sets off ahead of us, lo and behold, another ship appears from the depths and begins to attack them during their escape. Now, this first crew is completely depleted of resources, so we jump in to defend them. A well-placed powder keg, and down goes the attacker. We arrive together at Plunder Outpost and collect another set of riches. Now, I must confess, the grog had been flowing both on and off the Sea of Thieves this evening. So in the words of Frank the Tank, we're going to do one more. Now, our ship is still fully loaded as our second bout with the skeletons was a short one, and we still had many powder kegs at our disposal. Our trusty crew of three decided to set sail on our own for what we had planned to be a quick dispatching of the invaders. This is where we went wrong. Upon arriving on site to defend the ancient isles again, we begin the battle with the initial onslaught of cursed ships. We start attacking them with both cannonballs and kegs and make easy work of the first two ships. We had a solid strategy where one person piloted the ship, one would keg the opponent, and one would defend the damage on the ship we were attacking. The men on the helm also had to keep the ship afloat, which can sometimes be troublesome. After the first waves, the second wave began and we started hammering them into submission. At this point, we were still well supplied and doing a good job inflicting damage. Unfortunately, so are the invading ships, 
and they launch their special blend of attack, causing everyone to become intoxicated like a late night frat party. This is where things go south. And due to damage and inability to effectively manage damage control due to extreme intoxication, our trusty brigantine succumbs to her wounds. As the mast slips below the seas, we have two crew members in the water near the invaders. While one brave crew member went down with the ship, all of our supplies are lost. Yet we decide we're going to keep at the fight and never give up. Our lone crewman sails our newest ship into the fray with limited supplies but endless confidence. Upon arrival, we begin the onslaught of cannon fire and manage to drop these two ships to Davy Jones' locker. Now, we're five ships down and more to go. Another two ships appear from the, below the waves and begin the onslaught. Having recently christened ship, we have limited supplies and our planks and food are running low. We are also now just about out of ammo, facing two fully crewed skeleton ships. With no other valuable options, we take extreme measures and put our shipwright skills to the test. We begin using our ship as a weapon and start ramming the nefarious skeleton ships to inflict as much damage as we can. We have one crew member constantly bailing water off our ship as we don't have the supplies to keep repairing all our own damage. This continues for what seems like an eternity of just hammering them and bailing out water. Our crew member was able to hop off and pillage barrels to get us some supplies to help limit the damage we couldn't fix. As we are engaging these ships, in the distance we notice another crew and pray they come to our aid in the battle of attrition. As we continue fighting, the other crew either does not see us or does not care as they are casually sailing away, leaving us to our demise. As morale is beginning to fade and reality is setting in, one of the other ships succumbs to the waves. Now it's our crew on our hobbled ship and the fearless captain and his fearsome galleon. We're still taking on water, but given it's a one-on-one -on -one fight, we keep bringing the heat. Round and round we go, slamming each other and exchanging pot shots from the cannon. One of our crew gets emboldened and boards their ship, slaying skeletons on his way to the lower decks, defending the damage we are inflicting. During this epic battle, we continue to look on to the horizon for assistance, but none is in sight. We keep at them, never relenting. And then, after a total of two and a half hours, we hear the sweet symphony of victory. As the final invader sinks to their watery grave, we collect the spoils of war. Our ship, badly damaged and barely holding together, now loaded with recently acquired wealth, set sails for plunder outpost. As we slide by other islands, we pray to Neptune that there are no other beasts or invaders spring upon us. As we slide into port, we all let out a largest exhaust I have ever heard. Raise a toast and celebrate a well-earned victory. After turning in all the loot and amassing a small fortune, we retire ourselves to our quarters, where dreams of plunder and war fill our minds. Plunder on. Elbardo, wow. That sounds like quite the adventure, and kudos to you for sticking with it. You may not always have help out there on the seas, but as long as you have the strength of will to persevere, I don't doubt that you'll always come out on top. For all you other pirates, I'm going to say that this is probably a very similar situation to most of you, as it happened to me multiple times. And it seems like this really is a war of attrition. The undead are relentless, and supplies are limited. Make sure you take heed, supply up, be prepared for this. As we get into the third week of curse sales, I'm looking forward to these new skeleton crews, and maybe taking on Wanda? Who knows? That's gonna do it for this episode of Keelhauled. Pirates, if you enjoyed this, do me a favor, head over to iTunes, give my, my show a rating an honest rating and an honest review, something that speaks to you. If you want to get a hold of me, you can always do so. There's plenty of ways to do it. My email address is captainlogan at gmail.com. That's C-A-P-T-L-O-G-U-N at gmail.com. Like Albardo here sending me a, a very lengthy but very worthwhile adventure. I love reading these out for you because it's stories from you. It's st stories from other pirates. And I have my stories and they may sound similar, but everyone has an amazing experience to share. Feel free to send me those emails. You can also reach me on Twitter at C-A-P-T underscore L-O-G-U-N. If you want to reach me in game, feel free to do so. C-A-P-T-A-I-N-L-O-G-U-N. That's all one word, no spaces. That's my gamer tag. I'm also trying to stream more uh, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash C-A-P-T underscore L-O-G-U-N. If I'm not, I'm usually hosting someone who's a good streamer as well too, but I will try to make sure that I get more streams in for people wanting to watch Sea of Thieves. It's just rough on the system. Other than that, I 
I think that's going to do it. Did I miss anything? I, I don't know. If I did, I'm sorry. Until then, I'll see you on the Sea of Thieves.